This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Roots and All, where my guest is garden designer, TV personality, and trustee of the Gardening with Disabilities Trust, Mark Lane. Mark talks about the various types of challenges people can face that might impede their activity in the garden and how gardens and gardening can be adapted to enable people to carry on with these activities. He gives some excellent practical advice for anyone who may need to adapt horticulture to suit their own needs or those of others. Mark starts by talking about his background in gardening and how he became involved in the Gardening with Disabilities Trust. So I'm a trustee for Gardening with Disabilities Trust. It's a very small charity. It's all voluntary-led. There's a very small executive committee, again, all volunteers, but we give out small grants for people who may have been injured or have a disability. They may have been into gardening before or they're new to gardening. And these small little grants help out by sort of paying for some raised beds, maybe a small greenhouse, plants, seeds. It really can be anything, but it's not a huge amount. So it's not one of those charities which gives out, you know, tens of thousands of pounds. These are small grants, but they really do make a difference. And it was set up in 1968 by an incredible woman called Mrs. Peggy Kinsey. And she knew the importance of horticultural therapy. And she just wanted people to get outside, into the fresh air, be a little bit active. And as she said, she really wanted people to get the soil underneath their fingernails and as a gardener myself I know exactly what that means and what that feels like so I got into gardening from a very young age my grandparents used to have large gardens and I followed my paternal grandfather around their large garden and he had a big veggie patch right at the back and he taught me how to care for the soil what plants to grow, how to grow stuff from seed, um, how to tie in plants, how to prune plants. And then my paternal grandmother, she was a flower arranger. So she taught me about colour, form, texture and how to put them all together. And then on my mother's side, um, the garden was just full of roses. And as kids, all we ever wanted to do was go out and play in the garden. But she used to get us picking up all of the leaves that got black spot on them, squishing the aphids between our fingernails. And I actually grew up in an apartment in Hove, just outside of Brighton. And we had these communal gardens. And they weren't particularly large. There were only 10 flats in total. But the most of it was lawn or shrubs. And there was one bed, and it was a circular bed, and it had a single bush rose right in the centre. It was bright yellow, I remember to this day. And I remember saying to my mum, I must have only been about probably seven or eight Can we go down and maybe plant something? Could we put something in that bed? And if so, what is it that we could actually plant? And she said, yeah, I'm sure we could do something like that. Why not? So we did. We went along the garden centre. We just bought some bedding plants. We put them in. And within about 12 months, each of the apartments had decided that they too wanted to go out and do some stuff. So we all had our own little area in the garden and it was lovely because there were all different ages all different backgrounds and we all just went out there with a cup of tea we used to chat I remember a lovely old gentleman telling me about time in the war and all the experiences that he had and how he always felt gardening to be very relaxing so that's sort of my gardening background I suppose and then I went off to university and then sort of forgot about gardening for a little bit apart from one when I lived in a house in Golders Green we had a small garden there And the lawn was probably about four and a half feet tall. So we hacked that back and we actually grew tomatoes. And it was lovely to do. And we got a bumper crop, which was what a lovely. And then it wasn't until I met my hubby uh, almost 30 years ago now that we bought our first place that came in a small garden. And then every time we've moved, the gardens got bigger. And I sort of treat my garden as my sweetie shop in a way and also my playground for the garden design business so I can sort of play with plants see how things grow I do like going out there and digging plants up because I'm absolutely fascinated by their root system and then just seeing what works and what doesn't work and of course you know like everybody there are failures and those failures unfortunately just mean that you just go on and get on and do something else and that's what I love about gardening is that it's always changing and you can just go out there and change it whenever you want. 
obviously, you know, you work with the charity and they're there to help people. Do we know how many people in the UK are gardening with disabilities? I suspect it's probably a lot more than people even think about or realise, is it? Top of my head, I think it's around about the five and a half, six million disabled people in the UK, if not more, actually. But I do know that through not just this charity, but other charities that I work with, that I think it's somewhere in the region of anywhere between two and a half and four million actual people with disabilities who do love to garden. But actually, that's also a bit sort of far reaching because disability with a capital D can actually mean a lot to so many different people. And just because the population is getting older, obviously, as, as old age comes along, unfortunately, illnesses do come along, as do disabilities come along as well. So the more well, we do live longer, obviously, the more, unfortunately, more people will require help. And it's quite a shock to many people, especially if they were very mobile beforehand and they are now less able to go out and actually do stuff. Just by rethinking the way you actually do gardening doesn't mean that you have to stop. And I think that's what's the beauty about it, again, is that just with a little bit of thought, so many people can actually do gardening. And I know that we only, as a charity, help, I think it's about 1,500 people a year, and that can be individuals through to groups and schools and associations. But throughout the whole of the UK, there's a lot of people. And yeah, we just need to deal with all of them. And I think it actually, I think I've just had a quick look, it's actually just under 15 million people who are actually disabled in the UK. So half of those are probably a pensionable age and with a disability. And then around about 20%, I think, are working age. So, you know, we're looking at high numbers. We're looking at millions of people. And it's often a forgotten group which is a bit silly. We call it the purple pound. And actually, there is a lot of people out there who do want to carry on gardening and have a little bit of spare money that they want to do it. And actually, I was thinking about this beforehand. And I thought, as you said, it's particularly for people who've maybe lost the ability or feel that they've lost the ability to garden. It might be more that you don't have the ability to garden as you did previously. And that suggests that there are adaptations to be made. And I think sometimes people can assume that gardening is one of the more tricky hobbies to modify. Do you feel that's the case or do you think that's a common perception? I think it's a common perception. As I always say, everything that I do, whether it's gardening or not, I've always got to think outside the box and think about how I can actually do something in a different way to the way I used to do it when I was more able-bodied. Um, and I think, unfortunately, there's still this sort of misconception that if you're labelled as disabled, that you cannot do anything. And as I, as I said earlier, you know, disability with a capital D is far reaching and, and really, really wide. So I think a lot of it is down to the fact that there aren't that many adaptive tools out there. And there are a few, but they're still costly. And unfortunately, as soon as you say the word disability, you know, an extra zero seems to appear on the end of the pound sign which obviously, again, puts people off. But there are some adaptations out there. And more and more, especially with regards to tool equipment and tools, there are many manufacturers now who are trying to bring out lighter weight. You don't have to stretch so much. So they've got longer handles or longer blades. And they're easier on the wrist. So if you've got really chronic arthritis in your hand, for example, they make it easier to prune. So there are all these things out there, but you do have to go hunting for them. They're not normally stocked in garden centres or nurseries. And I think that in itself, that's their fault. And it's the marketing side of the company that they're not actually looking at that market. And they should be. Because not everybody can handle a wooden handled steel spade, which might weigh a couple of pounds. And you can't do that, you know, day in, day out or every time you're out in the garden. I personally have sort of tried to approach it from the point of view that I always assess what it is that I can do in the house. So that might be, how far can I twist my body? How far can I reach? Can I twist my neck in order to look at something? Can I reach upwards? Can I reach downwards? If I was able to, could I get out of my wheelchair onto my bottom, which I do anyway? If someone walk, but they have difficulty kneeling down, are there tools or things that they can use to get them down onto the floor and then lift them back up again? 
So it's always about looking at what it is you can do, is what I always say, first of all, and then think how you can adapt that to the outside environment. And I've got this sort of very handy little tool trolley. looks a bit like a golf trolley. I put all of my tools in there that I'm going to need for that morning or the day if I'm out there for a whole day. And that means I don't have to keep going backwards and forwards to the potting shed or to the garage. And then every time I go to a garden centre and I find a new tool, rather than just picking it up and going straight to the till, I go around the garden centre for half an hour carrying it, making sure that it's comfortable in my hand, the weight feels okay, it seems to be well balanced. Um, And if after half an hour it is good and it feels comfortable, then it's probably a tool that's going to work for you. And then there are some brilliant silicon handles that you can attach to frying pans and saucepans in the kitchen. And actually, when you look at kitchenware, there's actually quite a lot of adapted tools and equipment, which you can easily use in the garden setting. So these little silicon handles, you can easily put over trowels or small spades, and they just mean you've got extra grip, because sometimes the grip on these little tools aren't particularly brilliant, and you know they're not going to slip out of your hands. So I think there is that misconception that people with a disability cannot garden, but I always say, always look at what you can do and then approach it from that side. And I wanted to ask you about practical tips that people can apply in their gardens, which is exactly what you've just spoken about. And to do that, I think, much as I don't like to talk in generalities, it might be useful if we can, or if you're able to, can you say that there are common challenges that gardeners face that you see quite a lot coming through the charity? Because I was thinking if there are more common ones, perhaps you could talk about some of the solutions to those more commonly faced problems. Of course. I mean, one of the biggest problems is obviously if you're working in the ground, you know, that ground can be several feet away from you. And that isn't always the most comfortable position to be in if you're standing. If you're in a wheelchair or you use a frame, then obviously using tools to try and dig in the ground isn't always that easy. So we do see at the charity actually quite a lot of requests for raised beds, but also raised tables. And I would actually urge people, if they are less mobile, and they find it more comfortable to sit down to garden, to actually go for raised tables and mangers rather than raised beds. And the reason for that is a raised bed has just a flat side. And if you're sitting, A, you can't get your knees under, but B, if you've got a tight back or you can't twist for whatever reason, you can't really garden in the whole of that raised bed. So that's where a raised table comes in so much better because you can get your knees under, you're working directly in front of you. And obviously you can get raised tables and mangers where it has a deeper bit towards the back. So you can still grow sort of nice long tap-rooted plants as well that can go in the back. And then sort of towards the front, you know, your sort of your lettuces and sort of perennials that don't need a lot of soil at the front. So I would always say that, but I would also say that if you are looking at a raised table or a raised manger, always try it out because it's still they're not all fully accessible so that's where a table is better than a manger because sometimes the manger the angle at the at the bottom is too steep or it may not give you enough space to get your legs and your knees under so always give it a try so that's where we always come in especially with the charity and we're always trying to find solutions like that the other one is a lot of people who again can't work low down and maybe find it a little tricky to lean forward if they're sitting down, is that they're looking towards vertical growing. And of course, there are many products out there now where you can sort of almost plug and play, and they're brilliant. And it also means that then that, you know, whatever you're growing is off the ground, so you're less likely to maybe get pests and maybe diseases. If you're growing things like lovely hanging strawberries, you know, the strawberries can all hang down, they're not going to be sitting on the soil. But it also means that it's at a workable, manageable height. So you can have it either just standing up at that sort of height, or you could easily have it at a height if you are sitting down and you can get to it from that point of view. So vertical walls are sort of taken off, especially with uh, individuals who are less mobile. The other thing that we normally find is that a lot of people do want to grow their own produce or their own flowers from seed, and they sort of require a cold frame or maybe a very small greenhouse and maybe the odd tool here and there and maybe some seed trays as well and I would say wherever possible 
a cold frame is brilliant. You don't have to go to the expense of a greenhouse. Yes, a greenhouse is lovely, but we could do so much with a cold frame. And again, depending upon your mobility, you can get cold frames that obviously sit on the ground, but you can now get cold frames that even sit on top of a raised table and a raised bed. So they are out there and you can even get the ones that have three interchangeable plastic covering with a mesh covering. So you can change it depending on the seasons. So it just sort of helps you extend your growing season as well. Some people don't like getting their hands in the soil. They don't like the feeling of it or they just don't like, you know, getting their hands dirty. I try and urge most people, please, please, you know, don't wear gloves. Do get your hands in the soil. It is good for you. You know, we know there's beneficial bacteria and uh, fungi in there, which does help with serotonin in the brain. So it is good, but I do fully understand at the same time that many people don't like it. So it's also about finding the right pair of gloves. And we give out quite a few gloves through the charity as well. So it's finding the right glove that fits you, where you can still feel the tools through it, where you can still maybe feel a seed. Because sometimes if you get some gloves that are very very thick you know you can't feel anything really through them so just have a look at that very closely as well also just to make it a little bit easier when it comes to sowing the seeds is you can buy them online especially they're sort of like pre-drilled holes of where you sow a seed and it's very simple you just lay it's like a bit of plastic it's got some holes in it you lay it over the top of a, a seed tray you then put your seeds through the hole, they go into the soil, and then you just either pop them in or just sprinkle a little bit of soil over the top when you remove the plastic, and it's done. The other thing that we're also seeing people really sort of relishing actually at the moment are seeds that are on tape, because that just means you can lay the tape down, cover it with soil, give it a water, and of course, you know, hopefully the seeds germinate, and up come your lovely produce or your flowers. So there are things out there, but I still think there's a long way to go. Yes, I'm sure. And also that I think is dependent upon the people who design gardens or lay out public spaces. And I'm thinking a lot of the people that listen to the podcast are going to be professional gardeners or garden designers such as yourself. Is there anywhere they can go and get guidance as to the best practice? Unfortunately, when it comes to things like the building regulations, the building regulations only ever deal with the approach to a building. They never actually deal with the outside environment, as in a garden. I wrote an article for the Garden Design Journal, I think it was last year, and it was actually one of the first accessible articles they'd actually had, which was very practical. I'm always at hand if people do need to ask questions. It's very simple things, which is like, if you're thinking about pathways, a lot of the time you'll see the regulations will say anywhere between 90 centimetres to a metre wide. I say you need to go wider. In theory, if there's the space, you should go for anywhere between one and a half and two metres. And the reason for that is it allows for someone else to walk side by side with you if you're in a wheelchair. It also means you've got space if someone's coming towards you that you don't have to sort of think, where do I go? Do I end up going into a flower bed? And then the most important thing is to ensure that there are turning circles and that those turning circles are large enough. And I would always say, a turning circle needs to be sort of at least three metres in diameter. And that's a big circle. I mean, when you draw it out on the ground, it is actually a big circle. But as soon as you get someone in a wheelchair over it, you can understand why and how you need it so big. Also, if people are, again, considering paving, always, where possible, put an edger, which has got a lip that's higher than the paving, because that just stops wheels, it stops feet. People can really feel where the edge is. So if you're partially sighted or you're blind or again if you're in a wheelchair or you use a walking frame it stops you so you don't end up in a flower bed also think about the material so you can look online especially if you sort of type in pendulum test paving and it's where all of the paving manufacturers they have this pendulum it's got like a little weight at the end and a sort of bit of grip and it swings back and forth and it tells them how slippery a surface actually is and they're really good to just like sort of gen up on because it's quite surprising. And you might think that sometimes resin-bound gravel is absolutely ideal, but resin-bound gravel is brilliant because it doesn't move. But when it gets wet, it can be quite slippery. So resin bonded, although it's not sort of surrounded by the resin, is sometimes better because it actually gives you better grip. And actually, a lot of National Trust places are now going for resin bonded rather than resin bound because of that reason. 
Also think about the colour when it comes to paving, purely because you don't want anything that's going to be really bright and reflective. And then that sort of ties in with lighting. So many times I see gardens being designed and, you know, bollard lights are going in. And all that light is, is just directly at someone's height who's in a wheelchair, for example. And it just blinds you. So I always say, well, if you can, try and flood a path from down low. That way you can see the path, you don't see the light source. And obviously, yes, you still want lighting for, you know, being able to do tasks in the garden, also for up lighting, for mood, etc. But just think about that sort of light source and see, is it going to blind anyone from any particular angle? There are regulations also about the overhang of trees, how high it should be. So around about sort of 2.2, 2.4 metres. That's, again, dependent upon, obviously, an individual's height. So if you know you're designing for a particular client or you're gardening and you're a particular height, obviously work to a height that's comfortable for you and just make sure that things don't dangle down in front of you so you're going to be constantly banging your head on them. Also, things like the textures. So when it comes to handrails, handrails are brilliant around a garden for many reasons. But obviously, if you imagine a metal handrail, that can get extremely cold and freezing cold, especially in the winter time. So that's going to put a lot of people from touching it, which is obviously against the whole idea of using a handrail. So that's where wood is really good. And even composite now, composite handrails are really good because they are warmer to the touch. They also have a better grip to them as well. When it comes to steps and ramps, the guidelines will say, go for a 1 in 12 ramp. I say go in for a 1 in 15 or if possible, a 1 in 20, because that means you've got less of a slope. It's not going to be so difficult. 1 in 12 is doable, but as soon as you put, say, I don't know, a bag on your back or a bag on your side, which could easily tip you backwards, Going up a 1 in 12 ramp is actually quite tricky. Steps, always try and leave the risers as low as possible. So, you know, again, regulations will say probably 12 to 15 centimetres. I say if you can, do them sort of 8 to 10. But again, have a look and see. Again, this is about going back to checking your own body and what it is you can do. So if you've got really bad arthritis, let's say, in your ankles, and you find it very difficult to lift your ankles, then maybe a ramp will be better for you. But sometimes a ramp can be very tricky coming down, especially if you've got really bad chronic arthritis in your ankles, because it's that angle, it's just a very difficult thing to do. So again, steps might be better, but just a much lower riser. And of course, handrails on both sides of the steps and not just on one side. So there are some regulations out there. The DDA, the Disability Discrimination Act, there are a few books out there which have been written, which again, are primarily to do with the indoor environment. But you can look at them and you can sort of see what height a handrail should be, you know, what sort of thickness the handrail should be, what the overhang of the handrail should be. And you can just adapt that and use that outside. So again, it's been that sort of a little bit adaptable and looking to see what is currently there and trying to make it work in your space. So when are you releasing your book, Mark, on this? A lot of people do keep asking me that. And I actually have been talking with the guys who create the building regs to say, look, come on, we should be doing something about this. I think it's something I I do want to do, but I think there's something holding me back at the moment. I'm not quite entirely sure what it is, but I think it's mainly because there are a few very good examples of good design. And I call that really good inclusive design. But there are others which say they're designed with accessibility in mind and you look at them and unfortunately can pick them apart. And I think that would actually be quite handy. I think seeing projects that work and don't work would be good. So maybe, put it this way, I'm not writing one yet, but um, maybe it's probably on the cards. I I imagine so anyway. There is a dearth of information, I think, sadly. Yeah. It is tricky to find information if you're trying to design a site I've found in experience. So anything like that would be really useful. That's been fantastic. So many good tips there. Is there anywhere else that you'd like to direct people to? You know, how can they help with the Gardening with Disabilities Trust if they want to? Can they go to the website? Where can they find out more? Of course. So if you go to gardeningwithdisabilitiestrust.org.uk. We'll take you through to the main page. There's a lovely big green button on there if you want to help with a donation. 
But you can also go on there and it tells you the whole process. If you are looking to get a small grant from the charity, you don't have to pay it back. It's, it is money that's just given to you for your garden. We do check to make sure that the money has been used for the reasons that it's done. That's where the executive committee come in. So go to that site. It's brilliant. I would also say go to Thrive site as well, which is thrive.org.uk. They're very much about social and therapeutic horticulture. They've got a section also on disabled gardening, as well as adaptive tools, which I've helped write for them. So that's also a really good one to go for. And also, it sounds rather bizarre, but the Landscape Institute do actually have some very good notes or documents or articles on um, accessibility and disability and inclusive design. The Landscape Institute is actually very good from that point of view. I would say also, you know, do use the internet. If you do type in inclusive design, that's an American term, but it is actually really, really good to actually understand from their point of view, because I don't know what it is, but the Americans seem to have picked up on the whole notion a lot earlier than we ever did. So if you type in inclusive design, then you'll actually find a little bit more information on it rather than just searching for accessible design. Thank you very much to Mark for taking part in this interview and thank you to you for listening as always. And if you need advice or guidance or would like to support the Gardening with Disabilities Trust, there are links in the show notes. Next up is Dr Ian Bedford with a rework of a segment he did previously, which includes the bug with potentially the most comedic common name in existence. Throughout the animal kingdom, there are many creatures that make noises by rubbing parts of their body together. A procedure that we call stridulation, producing sounds to scare a potential predator or perhaps attract a mate. And whilst this includes species of fish, snakes and spiders, by far the greatest number of stridulators are found within the insect world, with crickets and grasshoppers probably the most well known. But despite different insect species using different parts of their bodies to generate sound, the morphological features that enable them to stridulate are basically the same, and consist of tiny peg-like structures that might be on their legs or under their wing cases, which they rub over little bumps or ridges that might resemble a miniature washboard on another part of their body. And because of the different shapes and rigidity of these structures, the resultant chirps, rasps and trills will be unique for the different species. Essential when signalling their presence to a potential mate above the cacophony of sounds from within a wildlife-rich natural habitat. And with grasshoppers and crickets, their stridulations are so unique that even a well-trained human ear can differentiate the species. But this story of stridulating insects wouldn't be complete without mentioning the truly remarkable ability of a tiny aquatic hemipteran bug called Micronectar schultzii a species of lesser water boatman that's just two millimetres in length and inhabits ponds and streams throughout southern Britain. Because the male of this minuscule little water bug is recorded as being the loudest animal on earth relative to its size, stridulating so intensely that it can generate up to 99.2 decibels, equivalent to the noise from a full symphonic orchestra. And despite 99% of the noise being muted underwater, its song can still be heard from the riverbank. So how does this tiny creature achieve this? Well, just like the other stridulators, it rubs two parts of its body together. One being its abdomen, with rows of sound-enhancing ridges, and the other being a little appendage less than half the width of a human hair, which rather amusingly has resulted in this little water boatman becoming known as the singing penis. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. 
I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.